Hello, I'm hematologist oncologist Dr. Tony Talibi, and today we're going to discuss chronic lymphocytic leukemia, CLL. I have the pleasure of being with Dr. Joseph Rosenblatt. He is the professor of medicine and microbiology and chief of hematology oncology here at the University of Miami. And for me, he's beyond a mentor. He's more like a family member. So it's a pleasure for you to be here. Nice to see you, Tony. Thank you. So Dr. Rosenblatt, would you please tell our patients, what is CLL? Well, chronic lymphocytic leukemia is uh, actually the most common lymphoid malignancy in the Western world. And what it, that means is it is a disease in which lymphocytes, a type of white cell, mm -hmm. which are important in the immune system, uh, called B cells, which are, uh, are the white cells which make antibodies, are actually accumulating mm -hmm. um, and do not have a normal lifespan. And subsequently, the, uh, the white cell count in patients with CLL uh, is elevated, uh, and as they accumulate, they may also begin to accumulate in other areas where lymphocytes aggregate, such as uh, lymph nodes in the spleen. Mm -hmm. So generally speaking, how does one come to be diagnosed with CLL? Well, more and more CLL is actually being diagnosed on routine um, uh, blood tests. Mm -hmm. uh, what we call a complete blood count or uh, uh, CBC and differential mm -hmm. uh, that people have um, uh, uh, undergo when they go to see their regular internists or family physicians. Uh, those individuals who were diagnosed with CLL uh, and are simply incidentally found to have an elevated lymphocyte count um, uh, in their peripheral blood are uh, early stage CLL and mm -hmm. generally do very well. Other patients may notice uh, lumps in the form of enlarged lymph nodes either in their neck or under their arm or in their groin mm -hmm. and may bring that to the attention of a physician. Less and less commonly, uh, individuals will actually present with fevers, systemic symptoms, mm -hmm. unusual infections as a sign of more advanced chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and that is a less frequent occurrence. About a quarter of CLL patients may have unusual autoimmune diseases that re present, such as hemolytic anemias in which they make an antibody that causes uh, destruction of their own red cells, so they may present with anemia uh, rather than lymphocytosis. Um, uh, or, or others may pre present with uh, frequent infections due to uh, low antibodies, mm -hmm. um, what we call hypogamma globulinemia. Mm. So why do rep the lymphocytes begin to replicate too much? What is the reason for that? Well, there is a precursor condition to CLL called monoclonal B-cell lymphocytosis, which is really early CLL, mm. in which we s the same cell that uh, is replicating and accumulating in CLL is found in lower numbers in the blood, less than 5,000 per cubic millimeter. Once those cells uh, exceed 5,000, then we can make what we call a frank diagnosis of CLL. Mm -hmm. In most monoclonal B cell lymphocytosis, and in well over half of CLL in the Western world, there is a specific genetic defect that predisposes those lymphocytes to uh, a longer lifespan and to accumulation. And that is, uh, is specifically a very small deletion in chromosome 13, mm -hmm. uh, one of our chromosomes, um, that results uh, in a uh, mole molecular change mm -hmm. that, um, that causes lymphocytes to accumulate. And that change is a, uh, the loss of two microRNAs, mm -hmm. which are little regulatory uh, elements within the genome uh, that specifically control expression of other genes, like a gene called BCL2, um, that uh, govern the lifespan of CLL, uh, of CLL cells. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you look at the most common form of monoclonal B cell lymphocytosis and the most common uh, genetic abnormality in CLL, the most common error in the genome, mm -hmm. 
in our DNA that you see in patients with CLL, uh, usually that's a deletion in chromosome 13 mm. that involves a uh, deletion of two microRNAs. One is called microRNA 15A, mm -hmm. uh, and another is called microRNA 161. And both of them appear to be important in the control mm. of uh, other genes that govern the, the lifespan of lymphocytes. So when you knock those microRNAs out, or when you're deleted, mm -hmm. lymphocytes begin to accumulate. Wow. For our patients, would you please explain what the staging is, stages one through four? Well, the basic staging in CLL is really a, a function, really, of disease volume. Mm -hmm. So the stages actually start with zero, right? Mm -hmm. So a patient who presents with uh, just uh, a, uh, lymphocytosis or an elevated lymphocyte mm -hmm. count in the blood will be called stage zero. Mm -hmm. uh, patients who present with both lymphocytosis and enlarged lymph nodes mm -hmm. are, are, are stage uh, one mm -hmm. um, or um, depending on um, uh, uh, whether or not they may also have an enlarged spleen uh, in addition to the enlarged lymph nodes they may be stage two. Right. Patients who have anemia, that is a hemoglobin uh, by our Western criteria, or the so-called RISE staging, mm -hmm. named after Conti Rye, a very famous hematologist mm -hmm. and friend of mine who uh, worked out uh, staging for CLL in the 70s. Mm -hmm. Patients who have anemia um, will uh, are uh, uh, considered to be stage 3, mm -hmm. and patients who have significant thrombocytopenia or low platelet counts mm -hmm. are, are considered stage four. For practical purposes, you can look at the staging as patients having either low volume disease and low risk, mm -hmm. such as patients with lymphocytosis or minimal lymphocytosis and enlarged lymph nodes, lymphadenopathy, versus patients uh, with intermediate risk who have lymphocytosis, significant lymphadenopathy, enlarged spleens, and patients at the highest risk who may have those features and in addition have anemia and low platelets or thrombocytopenia. I see. Are there any risk factors associated with developing CLL? We know that, um, that, page, that uh, people who uh, come from families with CLL mm -hmm. have approximately eightfold increased incidence of CLL compared to patients who come from families in which nobody else has CLL. Yeah. We have not yet isolated the genes that are res responsible for familial CLL. We do know that the risk of CLL, and uh, CLL is not a common, common mm -hmm. illness. Um, there are only about 14,000 new cases of CLL a year in the United States. Um, the risk of CLL is much higher in Western countries mm -hmm. and among Western Caucasians than it is among mm -hmm. Asians. Uh, rarely is CLL encountered in China or Japan, mm -hmm. and it doesn't form an important component of B cell malignancy in those countries, yet in our country uh, it is, uh, accounts for approximately 34% of all leukemias um, and uh, is the most common lymphoid malignancy. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons for it being so common is most patients with CLL will live a long time. Mm. Uh, and therefore, uh, if you're a hematologist, more often than not, these type of patients will accumulate mm -hmm. uh, in your practice. I see. So getting back to that, if someone is diagnosed with CLL, should their family members have test, genetic testing? Um, well, we don't know what genetic testing to do for CLL. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, one could argue that if somebody is diagnosed with CLL, um, that, um, that family members might want to have a complete blood count uh, mm -hmm. done during their next routine appointment. Okay. It is not an indication to run to the doctor and worry about whether you have CLL, mm -hmm. particularly if you have no symptoms, no enlarged lymph nodes, no other reason to think so. Um, this is an uncommon illness. Mm -hmm despite the fact that there are many patients with this illness in the United States. As I mentioned, you know, 15,000 new cases a year is not uh, an enormous number of cases. But nevertheless, nevertheless, um, as, uh, since the risk uh, 
of having CLL is increased in family members, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's not unreasonable that, for example, during routine checkups, uh, that they might add a blood count. I see. Okay. Are, are there any lymphomas that sometimes get mistaken for CLL? There are really about three uh, other entities that um, can look like CLL. Mm -hmm. One is a low-grade lymphoma, which is a variant of marginal zone lymphoma called uh, splenic lymphoma with villus lymphocytes. Mm -hmm. now, that also is a very benign illness. Patients do exceedingly well. They usually have enlarged spleens, sometimes have low blood counts, but uh, oftentimes need no therapy whatsoever mm -hmm. uh, and will pursue a very chronic and indolent course. Um, that cell uh, looks different under the microscope with characteristic mm. morphology, so good hematologists will be able to tell the difference, uh, and also looks uh, different in terms of the proteins that coat its surface mm -hmm. um, that can be identified by a test we call flow cytometry. Mm -hmm. Most CLL uh, characteristically will have two particular markers on its surface, one a protein called CD5 mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that can also be seen on T cells, yeah. and another a protein called CD23. Mm -hmm. uh, another illness that can look a lot like CLL and that can sometimes act in indolent fashion similar to CLL is mantle cell lymphoma. Mm -hmm. The difference between CLL and mantle cell lymphoma uh, is uh, first the overall prognosis, mantle cell lymphoma carries a much worse prognosis as a rule, although mm -hmm. there are indolent forms of mantle cell lymphoma. But the other is that um, uh, the two proteins I mentioned, CD5 and CD23, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. while CD5 is often seen on the surface of mantle cells, mm -hmm. CD23 is not seen on mantle cells, and that can alert a hematologist that you may be dealing with a mantle cell lymphoma. And then finally, there is a particularly virulent uh, um, type of leukemia, uh, that presents with very high counts, large spleens, oftentimes with fevers and night sweats, and systemic symptoms called prolymphocytic mm -hmm. leukemia. Mm -hmm. That also has slightly different markers that can be discerned by flow cytometry than mm -hmm. CLL, uh, and also is much more difficult to treat and um, uh, should be really treated in specialized centers. I see. So let's assume that a patient has been diagnosed with CLL, either excisional lymph node biopsy or flow cytometry. Generally speaking, what happens next for that patient? So at that point, um, the hematologist is going to want to get some sort of information regarding um, uh, both the stage of CLL, mm -hmm. um, uh, its overall prognosis, uh, its cytogenetics, and its phenotype. Mm -hmm. And all of those uh, uh, kind of combine together to allow the hematologist to decide on whether or not the patient needs to be treated, um, how aggressively the patient ought to be treated, and which agents are most likely to work. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, a CLL has characteristic cytogenetic abnormalities. Those are chromosomal deletions or mm -hmm. duplications that are seen specifically in CLL that tend to um, help hematologists prognosticate mm -hmm. or predict what the future might bring. So over half of CLL will simply have a deletion uh, in chromosome 13. Mm -hmm. uh, that carries an excellent prognosis in excess uh, uh, since, since uh, most CLL is diagnosed in patients 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. Uh, that carries a overall survival of over 130 months or greater than 10 years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, and really, uh, and many of those patients never come to treatment. If um, uh, additional chromosomal abnormalities that hematologists look for are abnormalities on uh, uh, chromosome uh, 11 mm -hmm. involving a gene called the ATM gene. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's good and bad in that particular chromosomal abnormality. The mm -hmm. bad is that it carries a worse prognosis mm -hmm. with approximately half the survival of patients um, with a chromosome 13 mm -hmm. abnormality. But um, the abnormalities in the ATM gene make that variant of CLL particularly susceptible to a class of agents that includes uh, the commonly used chemotherapeutic mm -hmm. drugs cyclophosphamide or mm -hmm. cytoxin called alkylating agents. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, there's another chromosomal abnormality that portends uh, a poor prognosis, and those are abnormalities uh, 
involving deletions in chromosome 17 mm -hmm. that affect a very um, famous tumor suppressor gene called P53. Now those individuals, rather than having a projected survival in the neighborhood of uh, uh, 130 months on average, which mm -hmm. is excellent, uh, actually have a projected survival that's much closer to two to three years. Wow. And, and really require additional treatment. And if you're dealing with a young patient, mm -hmm. um, then you may, who has that chromosomal abnormality, you may begin to think about strategies that might portend long-term mm -hmm. um, eradication, the CLL-like transplantation. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, there is a common uh, chromosomal abnormality in about 20% of patients that involves a duplication, extra duplication of chromosome 12 mm. or trisomy 12. So instead of having two copies, you'll mm -hmm. have three, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which uh, is abnormal. That actually portends a pretty good prognosis. Mm. I see. Slightly worse than 13, than 13 chromosome 13 abnormality, 13Q. I see. You mentioned this before, but this is so important. So let me ask you again, why do patients with CLL have higher risk of infection? Others. Well, there are two things. One is the general effacement of the bone marrow mm -hmm. by uh, meaning the general replacement of normal marrow elements by chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And that may result in uh, the marrow being incapable of responding adequately to an infection, incapable of producing enough neutrophils, mm -hmm. monocytes, and other normal cells to fight infection. Mm -hmm. So that's one issue. Mm -hmm. A second uh, important issue is that uh, CLL, for reasons that are not completely clear, mm -hmm. may actually suppress the production of a normal complement of antibodies. Mm -hmm. And about 30 to 40 percent of CLL patients will actually develop what we call hypogammaglobulinemia. Mm -hmm. Usually it involves a decrease in levels of IgG, mm -hmm. immunoglobulin G, which is a very important um, class of antibodies that's involved in protection against bacteria, mm -hmm. protozoans, viruses, and the like. Mm -hmm. So patients with hypogammaglobulinemia usually do not need treatments, but if you get a patient who is having recurrent bouts of mm -hmm. sinusitis, recurrent upper respiratory infection, recurrent bouts of pneumonia, recurrent um, urinary tract infections, uh, who has particularly low levels of antibody, you may want to consider replacing antibody with mm. intravenous immunoglobulin in such a patient. I usually make that decision not based on the antibody level, mm -hmm. uh, but based on the frequency of infections in the patients. Why are patients with CLL more apt to developing other cancers? Well, I think the first reason um, is uh, some of the patients may have a genetic predisposition. Mm -hmm. It is probably a mild one. Mm -hmm. um, and they're a little bit more prone to uh, develop uh, other lymphoid malignancies in addition to CLL. The other is that this is a disease which in some series has a median age of 66, another a median age of 70 or mm -hmm. more. Mm -hmm. So it is a disease of older patients. And older patients are more susceptible to cancer. The third is that some of the agents that we use to treat CLL may themselves be mutagenic mm -hmm. and introduce additional uh, mutations into the genome. We know, for example, I mentioned chromosome 17 abnormalities. Mm -hmm. If you look at patients who've never been treated, you know, less than 5% of them will have a chromosome 17 abnormality right. presentation. Mm -hmm. But that goes up to well over 25% in patients who have seen treatment for CLL. Uh, with chemotherapeutic agents. I see. You, you touch on this as well, but let me ask again because it's very important. What is autoimmune hemolytic anemia? So, um, we think there are actually three possibilities. One is occasionally the CLL clone itself is making an antibody, and antibodies are what are normally made in the body to target um, organisms, pathogens that can cause trouble, like mm -hmm. bacteria or fungi and the like. Um, but in this case, we're making an antibody that binds inappropriately to red cells mm -hmm. and targets them for destruction. Uh, in addition to that, it seems that uh, patients with CLL uh, have uh, significant dysregulation or impaired regulation of their normal 
antibody production and consequently they don't make a normal antibody repertoire. Mm. Some of them don't make enough antibodies and have what we mentioned before, hypogammaglobulinemia or low antibodies. Mm -hmm. Others uh, make inappropriate antibodies that they shouldn't be making mm. that can target self-antigens or proteins that are normally found on normal cells um, uh, and uh, target them for destruction. Um, and so uh, in the case of autoimmune hemolytic anemia that can occur um, in anywhere from 10 to 20 percent or so of CLL patients, um, an antibody is being made that actually targets antigens on the surface of red cells and, uh, and makes it such that uh, other components of the immune system called the reticuloendothelial system, like monocytes and macrophages, actually will destroy those cells. Many are destroyed in the spleen, for example. Mm. Uh, so uh, the, the objective, once such an antibody is identified, is to curb its production or eliminate its production, and we do that by giving the patient steroids, such as prednisone, and if that doesn't work, we can actually use an antibody that we also use to treat CLL mm -hmm. that eliminates B cells, which make antibodies called rituximab. Mm. So when you see a patient, how do you know, how do you prognosticate whether they're going to do well or poorly? Well, I think we look at a few things. Um, and, and the repertoire of clues that we use today mm -hmm. is different than what it used to be in the past. Um, <clears throat> the first is uh, when we first diagnose CLL, we do flow cytometry. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, the flow cytometry can actually discriminate between two classes of CLL. Mm -hmm. One is so called uh, unmutated CLL mm -hmm. of a relatively naive B cell that has not encountered antigen and has not matured. Mm -hmm. uh, its antigen receptor, which is the immunoglobulin on its surface. That is a cell that is yet to encounter what it is designed to target mm -hmm. uh, and is still in an immature phase. That, uh, that cell has an antibody mm -hmm. on its surface, um, which is its antigen receptor, that has not matured either because the way antibodies are made uh, is through assembly of uh, genes uh, from an assortment of genes that one can choose from and then once those genes are assembled in sequence um, and they're called uh, V for variable, D for diversity and J for joining mm -hmm. they are combined in a row and you can make an antibody heavy chain or uh, a light chain and a heavy, two heavy and two light chains come together to form an antibody. After cells encounter antigen, there is a second process that occurs in the lymph, lymph nodes mm -hmm. and in a part of the lymph nodes called the germinal center. Mm -hmm. And in those germinal centers, the, the coding sequences for antibodies actually undergo additional mutation mm -hmm. that serves to further refine and hone the antibody receptor to where it acquires even greater affinity mm -hmm. toward uh, whatever it's designed to target. That's called somatic mutation. Mm -hmm. Now, we know if a cell has undergone this kind of maturation uh, or this kind of um, process by comparing the sequence of its antigen receptor to the same sequence elsewhere mm -hmm. in other cells that are not B cells. Um, and if there's greater than 2% divergence, it means that new mutations have been introduced into the coding sequences. Mm -hmm. So CLL divides nicely into mutated mm -hmm. or unmutated CLL. The, the less mature cell is the unmutated variant. That type of CLL carries a worse prognosis mm -hmm. than CLL that's derived from a more mature or mutated variant. Now it turns out that the cells of the unmutated form of CLL look different um, when you examine their surface um, um, by a uh, flow cytometry 
for proteins that are expressed on the surface than do um, cells of the mutated variety. Mm -hmm. So the unmutated form, um, usually uh, a high proportion of cells will express a molecule called CD38. Mm -hmm. um, usually over 30% of the cells will do that. Um, and a fair number of uh, the cells will also express a protein called ZAP70, mm -hmm. which is normally not expressed in B cells, normally expressed in T cells. So if you get a CLL that expresses CD38 and ZAP70, it's likely to be of the unmutated form. Mm -hmm. If they don't express CD38 and ZAP70, um, and the cutoff levels have been determined by experimentation and study, mm -hmm. then those cells are likely to be of the mutated form. And as I would indicated, unmutated CLL, or the so-called immature form of CLL, mm -hmm. uh, does much uh, worse clinically mm -hmm. than the mutated form. It's much more likely to require treatment. Um, and um, and it carries a worse prognosis with a shorter projected lifespan. Mm -hmm. So that's one way of uh, differentiating. The other is, as I said, the staging itself. Mm -hmm. So if all you have is an elevated white blood cell count, you're likely to do very well. If you have that plus enlarged lymph nodes, you'll do somewhat worse. Mm -hmm. And the projected lifespan may go from 120, 130, months to 70 to 90. Mm -hmm. as, uh, as you acquire additional cells, um, and for example the spleen is enlarged, then that will go lower still. And if you have really packed your bone marrow to the point where you're now anemic with a hemoglobin of less than 10 mm -hmm. uh, or 11, depending on uh, different studies, uh, or a platelet count less than 100,000, then you're likely to do um, uh, even worse, and your projected lifespan goes down to the you know two to four year range. So all of these are ways of predicting how the CLL might might act. Um, the final bit of information that we touched upon earlier that's very useful is the cytogenetics. Mm -hmm. That is the genetic makeup of that CLL. And patients who only have a deletion in chromosome 13 do very well. Mm -hmm. Patients who have uh, normal cytogenetics do very well. Patients who have three copies of chromosome 12 do uh, reasonably well. Mm -hmm. But patients who have deletions in chromosome 11 affecting the ATM gene do worse. And patients who have chromosomes effect, uh, chromosomal deletions affecting chromosome 17 or P53 will do uh, uh, worse uh, than, than the previous patients I'd mentioned. So a doctor who's treating a CLL patient will look at cytogenetics, mm. he'll look at the flow cytometry, mm -hmm. he'll look at the clinical mm -hmm. uh, presentation of the patient. Does the patient have fevers, night sweats? Does the patient have anemia? Mm -hmm. Does the patient have enlarged lymph nodes, thrombocytopenia? Put all that together and come up with his or her best estimate of how this patient will do. Um, uh, and then there are some more esoteric means that we use to predict. Mm -hmm. uh, one is a protein that reflects lymphocyte numbers called beta-2 microglobulin. Mm -hmm. And we know less than 2 is good, 2 to 4 is intermediate, and greater than 4 is worse. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, uh, another uh, is something they call the lymphocyte doubling time. Mm -hmm. um, if you have CLL and you have a lymphocyte count of 300,000, uh, that hasn't changed in six years, mm -hmm. you're actually better off than somebody who has a lymphocyte count that's gone from 10,000 right. to 20,000 to 40,000 mm -hmm. to 80,000 in the last three months. Mm -hmm. So that's the lymphocyte doubling time. So, And then by looking at all this data, a clinician will form a general impression mm -hmm. and can usually give a patient reasonable amounts of information about what to expect and whether or not they will need treatment. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching. We hope this has been educational for you. In the upcoming video, we will discuss the actual treatment of CLL.